Hey everyone, this is Dr. Stella and today I will be explaining the functional matrix hypothesis. So this hypothesis was introduced formally by Melvin Moss in 1960s at a time when the sutural theory of Sitcher and the cartilaginous growth theory of Scott were being severely criticized for their inadequacy. This theory is based on the original concept of the functional cranial component as given by van der Klaus. So according to the functional matrix hypothesis, the origin, form, position, growth and maintenance of all these skeletal tissues and organs are always secondary to the prior events or processes that occur in specifically related non-skeletal tissues, organs or functional spaces. Now let us simplify this very complex definition. So simply, the growth of face occurs in response to the functional needs and the neurotrophic influences as mediated by the soft tissue in which the jaw is embedded. So precisely, as the soft tissues grow, the bone and the cartilage react. So the functional cranial component basically consists of the functional matrix and the skeletal unit. The skeletal unit is comprised of the bone, cartilage and the tendinous tissues. When a bone is comprised of several contiguous skeletal units, they are termed as the microskeletal units. For example, the mandible has within it the alveolar, angular, condylar, gonial, mental, coronoid and the basal microskeletal units. While on the other hand, when the adjoining portions of a number of neighboring bones are united to function as a single cranial component, we term this as a macroskeletal unit. And one example of this is the endocranial surface of the calvarium. The functional matrix on the other hand consists of muscles, glands, nerves, vessels, fat, teeth and the functioning spaces. This matrix is divided into the periosteal matrix and the capsular matrix. The neurocranial capsule surrounds and protects the brain, leptomeninges and the CSF. Orofacial capsule surrounds and protects the oronasopharyngeal spaces. Now let us see how these two components that is the functional matrix and the skeletal units are related to one another. The periosteal matrix which consists of the muscles, blood vessels, nerves and glands acts directly and actively upon their related microskeletal units and produce transformation of the size and shape of the skeletal units. This mainly occurs by the process of bone deposition and resorption. Capsular matrix on the other hand acts indirectly and passively on their related macroskeletal units producing a translation in space which is the change in the spatial position. This given flowchart is a wonderful short explanation of all the processes that take place according to this hypothesis. The clearest example of the functional matrix in operation is the growth of cranial wood as a direct response to the growth of the brain. Pressure exerted by the growing brain separates the cranial bones at the sutures and the new bones passively fill in at these sites so that the brain case fits the brain. Now the drawback of this original theory is that there is no clarification on how the functional needs are transmitted to the tissues. And according to Moss himself, the original theory faced two constraints, namely methodological and hierarchical. The methodological constraint arise due to the use of the arbitrary reference frames like the cephalometric radiograph, but now this problem is circumvented because of the introduction of finite element method. On the other hand, the hierarchical constraint arised because the original theory does not explain how the extrinsic functional matrix stimuli are transduced into the regulatory signals at the cellular and molecular levels. So this original version was somewhat sandwiched between these two hierarchical levels. So the original functional matrix hypothesis was revisited in the 1990s and the newer version tries to bridge the gap and explain the operation from the genome to the organ level. 
the revisited functional matrix hypothesis included four complementary concepts namely mechanotransduction osseous connected cellular networks genomic thesis epigenic antithesis and resolving synthesis so mechanotransduction is the process by which a mechanical stimulus is converted into biological signals to alter a cellular response according to the revisited theory bone itself acts as a connected cellular network this concept implicates the ability of bone cells to carry out intracellular mechanosensation and transduction and intracellular network communication while the concept of genomic thesis explains the genomic control and regulation of growth the final concept of epigenic antithesis and resolving synthesis rejected the previous genomic thesis and explained the phenotypical variability which can arise due to the spontaneous self organizing nature of the ontogenic process so that was all about the functional matrix theory the original concept and the revisited one so i hope you have understood well this topic in detail and in case of any questions you can comment in the comment section below